This week's conversation with Elizabeth Tapper of Lenham Needlecraft and the Art of the Needle is sponsored by Sassy Jack Stitchery. Kim and the folks at Sassy Jacks are getting ready to open their new forever home in January. It'll be exciting to be able to visit the new store. In the meantime, be sure to check out sassyjackstitchery.com for the full collection of sassafras samplers charts. And Kim and company are also now carrying the beautiful cottage garden threads. New designs from Ink Circles, including the Victorian Licensed Cosmo Kit. When you're doing your holiday shopping, a great gift for your stitching friends is a Sassy Jack's gift certificate. Make Sassy Jack Stitchery your local needlework store by visiting the website at sassyjackstitchery.com and plan to visit the new shop when it opens in January. And now, on to our conversation with Liz Tapper of Lenham Needlecraft and the Art of the Needle. Welcome back. I'm Gary Parr. And I'm Beth Ellicott. And you're listening to Fiverr Talk, the twice-weekly podcast for needlework artists. Our artist this week, from Lennon Needlecraft and the Art of the Needle, Liz Tapper. Liz, welcome. Hello. Nice to be here. Oh, glad to have you. So much to learn from you, because you've done everything. I wouldn't quite go that far. <laughs> well, we're going to go that far. You've done everything. The list is long. <laughs> Um, yep. there's still lots i want to do okay all right well i'm jealous of what you've accomplished so far so how's that now yeah. that would do <laughs> <laughs> um all right so uh, a graduate of the royal school how how do we uh, uh what's your journey to the royal school i have to blame my mother and my grandmother for that okay um, i i did embroidery from a young age at home uh, my mum studied embroidery needlework rather at teacher training college in the 60s um, and my nan has always enjoyed embroidery but that was mainly cross stitch back then and I don't know about over there but here when when a child starts off with embroidery it's normally on really um, low count ADA fabric mm -hmm. LA, and a nice blunt needle so that's what I started on. It was making little coasters for drinks, um, bookmarks. Um, I've still got some of them floating around somewhere, actually. But yeah, that, that started me off. And then from there, I, I found out about some more techniques. So um, mum and I went to a few adult education classes at the local centre. And that's when I dabbled a bit in black work. Um, and gold work and then we also went on a lovely embroidery holiday to France for a week I believe when I was about 18 and we visited the Bayer Tapestry and then we came back to where we were staying in the, the group with the group and we all made a replica of the Bayer horse or one of the Bayer horses um, in inlaid work and all of those those bits and pieces that I'd done all formed part of my portfolio for when I applied to um, join the apprenticeship at the Royal School of Needlework. So your mom, your mom was was the ultimate enabler then. That's great. Absolutely. I mean, this was really before, you know, the Internet took off. So it wasn't easy to find out about these different things. So I don't know how she managed to find out about the um, the RSN, the Royal School, but she did. And um, after doing my A-levels at, at school, that's from age 16 to 18, um, lots of people go to university. And I was a bit interested in, in university, but I was definitely more grabbed by textiles. Um, and I think mum had done her own research and, and found out about the RSN and it went from there really. I, I had an interview with um, the principal at the time, Liz Elvin, who's still around. And I amazingly was accepted as one of six apprentices. And then it, it all began. <laughs> <laughs> now, so all through, all through school, I mean, it's fascinating to me because 
you you start as a kid and then as a teenager and into your early 20s you know there's there's invariably some junctures in there where the needlework is a back seat to boys and parties and homework and all those things did uh, did the stitching uh, stay with you all the way through or did you have gaps where you just gave it a break it stayed with me um in a kind of low level capacity i'd say all the way through um when i got to secondary school the needlework teacher had just come back from being retrained from doing needlework to doing something called craft design and technology which basically meant that rather than doing needlework at school instead you were bending pieces of perspex to make pencil holders or you were um planing bits of wood and sticking them together to make cars it was completely different so instead I used to do my my embroidery at home you know, at the weekend or occasional evenings when I'd finished my homework and you know, that's that's where I snuck it in really um even with boys on the horizon <laughs> I still found a bit of time for embroidery <laughs> Now, Beth, your needle, Beth, your needlework teacher in school. What did you learn? Yeah, right. I, no, we didn't do any needlework in school. That's it. You know, you know, basic cooking. But you know, U.S. doesn't teach those things. Um, doesn't teach needlework at school, unless we do it. They do an extracurricular, unless somebody comes in. So that's kind of interesting that still in the U.K. they have those that they offer it at all. You mean offer through the RSN? No, the um, that in your is it in your um, secondary classes? No. They offer. It, it wasn't in mine because she just retrained from doing needlework. Um, it it loosely is present in school under textiles, but textiles can take the form of anything. So it could be sheets of metal, it could be wood, it can be man-made as anything um my daughter she's just started her gcses and she, we were looking at the gcse in textiles and it was nothing like what we thought so she's not actually doing it and that's it's a shame um there's there's so little provision for people who enjoy embroidery and textiles when you're school age nowadays here you know, my, when my mum was at school and my my nan they did dressmaking, for example, and then they would um, embellish what they made with stitches. But no, there's nothing like that. Not in school. Yeah, that's essentially been eliminated here too. And um, uh, I mean, my my whole orientation was science all the way through school, but I still remember in eighth grade, the uh, half semester we had that was cooking and sewing. And uh, uh, I forget what the third thing was, but, you know, just valuable life skills that um, you, you just don't get unless, you know, I mean, your your parents apparently, I mean, should should show you some of those things. But still, there's uh, getting those in school. And then, yeah, you wonder how many people would end up on a path like yours if they had given, you know, been given that exposure. Of course, you had the advantage of your mother, but you know, in, in a school setting to be able to experience some of that. And, uh, uh, yeah, it, it gets lost, I think. And I think a, there's a good number of kids that would have chosen different paths if they'd had it. Absolutely. I mean, when when the apprenticeship was running at the RSN, like I, as I said before, they only took on about six students a year. So there weren't many anyway doing it, Um and they were mainly female, um, but, but I think nowadays the, the 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 interest is more towards fashion mm -hmm. and how embroidery and and fabric embellishment can be applied to fashion. So actually learning the traditional hand embroidery techniques is well clearly not as popular as it used to be <laughs> ago but yeah. it's still it's still you know there's still a core of people who 
who are interested by it. And I think it just, that core of people, just keep it, you know, humming along in the background. And then fashion, as in, um, not clothes fashion, but the trends of, of ages, they will rise and fall and it will come back into fashion, hopefully, and then it might fall away again. I've noticed that with certain techniques, um, particularly things like Mount Melick in white work, that had a revival a few years ago. Gold works very popular currently, and that's been so for a few years now. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the Royal School, uh, I, I give them credit all day long for really, I think, staying at the front edge of of needlework and making it available and teaching it and um, uh, really, I, I think, have done a, a tremendous job of of moving it forward rather than just sitting there as a as a aged institution and you know and and not really doing anything i mean that the stitch bank they have and uh the classes yeah. online and uh, in the states i mean there's just so much they're doing to further the cause and you really give them a lot of credit for that absolutely and i think covid actually helped with that yeah. You know, they, they suddenly had to go online because otherwise there was nothing coming in. Um, so they they put lots of classes online and they do the online talks, which um, I find really interesting as well. Um, and they've. You know, apart from COVID, they they have so many classes nowadays. They have the certificate and diploma. They have the day classes. They have the future tutors who were the equivalent who are the equivalent to the apprenticeship um students and they have the um degree students as well mm -hmm. so much going on yeah oh, there's no, something uh, yeah they're, they're just outreach all over the place it's really uh really admirable yes yes <laughs> and, and it's nice that it's any level i think sometimes we tend to think oh the royal school of needlework it's, it's above what i can do but i, I really think they offer something for anybody um, you know you can be a beginner a rank beginner and take an online class just make sure you're signed up for the right one um, yes yeah I had a, a bunch of took the I think the B one the gold work I think it was the gold work B came on like a year ago and some of them had never done gold work before and they said it was a fabulous class just a great way to learn how to do a technique that they wanted to try it's so nice to hear that kind of thing you know that someone has really enjoyed a class because and regardless of their skill level because you know a class might say beginners or advanced but ultimately the tutor can bend the tuition to the student you know regardless of what what skill level the actual class is yeah one thing in all of the uh rsn people that we've talked to this become quite clear is once you go through one of their intense programs and come out of it with a certificate, diploma, whatever it is, uh, the one thing that you learn above all else is whether you really love needle and thread and embroidery and uh, needlework in general, because uh, those are those are pretty intense things. And uh, from from all the descriptions, almost around the clock needlework for a long time. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, yes. I'm I'm mentally reliving that period right now. Um <laughs> yes. <laughs> it was it was so so busy. I mean I was eighteen when I started my apprenticeship, um, and it was three years. And of the six, four of us finished the course, two dropped out because they found it just wasn't for them. Um yeah. but you would your timetable basically would have you working on three things at the same time at different stages. So one would be in the design stage, uh, all different techniques. Um, so you might have black work in the design stage. You might have gold work currently on the, the slate frame being worked on. And then you might have canvas shading being mounted. Plus you've got all the notes, all the research um, and how to notes to do for every technique, plus illustrations, stitch guides, <laughs> um thread samples um oh god so much plus exhibit 
plus exhibiting and demonstrating at like, Alexandra Palace, the knitting and stitching shows at Olympia. Uh, and and oh, <laughs> and when all the all the university students were on holiday, we would go down to what was then called the workroom. So it's now the studio and we would work on various commissions that come in and that could range from from preparing a sampler, reweaving an old um, tapestry hanging to stitching something entirely new, like um, the the ecclesiastical vestments for Wales Cathedral just down the road from me. Somehow I still managed to find time for boys. Not quite sure how. Or <laughs> <laughs> well, you're young. Young then. <laughs> I know, I think I just needed less sleep in those days. But I, I do remember staying up late, or too late, on several occasions. One occasion I invented my own stitch, which had to be unpicked. <laughs> and another time I was working on something called tapestry shading, which is where all the stitches have to be um, in a, a vertical um, orientation. And the bits I worked on and was very pleased with that night, I looked up the next morning and it wasn't vertical it was following the angle so again I had to unpick it so yeah the moral of that story is don't get involved with boys don't stay up late just just work hard (laughs) (laughs) those boys they can really take you down the wrong path huh absolutely yes (laughs) sorry Gary yeah it's all right I I, I'm getting used to it yeah But it just it, it's so cool because, you know, when you just described all of that, what a what a tremendous broad exposure you get to all aspects and uh, come out of there. I mean, you really come out of that with a, a full knowledge of needlework, you know, regardless of, of what your skill level is at. And I'm sure by the time you're done, it's quite high. But uh, just your exposure alone is so valuable. It is, and you're introduced to so many different techniques. But I think the more that you learn, the more you realise how many other techniques are out there that you don't know anything about. You know, in in the world, every country has its own special techniques, and they're all wonderful. And and we only know really a few of them. Mm-hmm. You know, the RSN does teach you a lot. Um, and you, you learn at least five different white work techniques among, you know, among others. Again, you know, even white work, there's so many different types. So did you have a favorite technique that you learned while you were there? Um, my favorite technique, I think it was a silk shading at the time. So I did a silk shaded snowdrop for my first piece. And I did, um, for my second year, I did the tapestry shaded saint. So we all had to do a cross, a saint and an animal in, in our second year at that time. So the tapestry shaded, shaded saint um, and then a, a peregrine falcon. Mm. And then since I've done a few other birds, actually, I was commissioned to do a pair of buzzards on a piano stall. And I did um, a long tail tit for my, for my husband's birthday last year in lockdown. But it, it's a lovely technique to do. It's, just, it's very fine just using one strand of, of stranded cotton. Do you find yeah. it relaxing? I do, yes. I think okay. the bit I don't find relaxing is is getting everything together <laughs> and actually finding the time to do it. Because although I am trained as an embroiderer, I don't have a lot of time actually to spend embroidering it's all um there's lots of admin yeah uh, there's lots of you know um designing for kits uh, i the, the the mainly the embroidery i get to do these days is when i've designed a kit i then stitch it and i photograph it comprehensively and i write the instructions up and that's i suppose my my stitching downtime <laughs> but, but stitching for myself doesn't happen yeah the only stitching I do for myself is making curtains and blinds on the sewing machine, which oh, does not count. <laughs> no, no. Well, I, I mean, I think anyone who uh, has a business in needlework 
would would tell that same story that to uh, to be able to sit down and just stitch for pure enjoyment you know the opportunities are just so small because there's always always something that needs to be done to get the next kid out or you know basic paperwork and financial things it just uh yeah it takes a lot of time it does it does and i think a lot of people don't realize that when they set up a business in embroidery yeah that it's going to take that much of your time so in working on commissions is another way that i um spend time embroidering and that's nice and that's that's varied as well so that can that can be anything yeah, that's a that's a fascinating world, and and you apparently do a lot of it. Um, what what is that like in terms of? Because you, you've got a customer, and you're creating a piece of art for them instead of a piece of art for you. Uh, what what there, there's got to be a lot of early work involved to understand what they're after, and then your own interpretation, and then whether you like it or not, you got to plow through and get it done. <laughs> I, I've always liked what I've done. Um, but there is there is lots of prep beforehand. Yes, you have to figure out what the customer wants. And then you have to do lots of research. You have to make it embroiderable, as if that's a word, because <laughs> lots of lots of images don't necessarily translate into particular embroidery techniques very well. You need to adapt them. Um, And then you need to choose obviously all the colours and again the technique, it might not necessarily be silk shading, it could be anything. But I think I've always, I've always designed things that I just ultimately like and it seems to fit in with what my customer likes. So I suppose because they've seen my portfolio online, they know what my style is. Yeah, I think if we lined up 10 people, we'd probably easily find half of them who want nothing to do with commissions. And then you know a, a, a range other than that, and because uh, it's got to be, it's just a different way to go about needlework. Yes, it's a less um, personal way, I suppose, because you're not doing it for yourself. You don't get to keep what you just created, which sometimes is a shame. Yes. You know, those <laughs> that I did on on the piano stool, I was really happy with them to start with. When I when I was at the designing stage. It was such a headache because <laughs> because they were so tiny and the the feathers were each individually stitched and I was just thinking oh my goodness what have I done <laughs> but, but you just have to sit down and get your teeth into it and then it all comes together that's what I've always found you know particularly with big projects it, it takes a lot longer to to do the research a lot longer to do the designing but when you actually sit down providing you've done all that back work um background work beforehand it all comes together when you get to stitch and when you hand that over to the customer uh that's got to be uh, i would guess most times just really exciting to see them uh, be pleased with the result yes definitely definitely because I, I i tend to send them photos of it in progress just so I I can show them I'm actually working on it <laughs> I'm not just sat here <laughs> but also so that if there's anything they're not happy with they can let me know while it's still in the embroidering stage yeah but no they've all been happy and I I also have to be happy with it if I'm not happy with it then it's not finished yeah yeah uh that's um I don't think I'd have the courage to do that, but um, uh, you might be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, baby steps. Okay. okay. I'll <laughs> so, put it. I'll so, put it on the list. <laughs> <laughs> so, how did you get the Napoleonic coat commission? I, I, that was just a beautiful goldwork piece that uh, I saw the little PBC video that was interviewed that yes. was taken. Yes. I well, I, I didn't know about anything about it until my client actually contacted me. And I think he had just Googled gold work embroidery on the internet. And my website came up, had a, a look and got in contact. And it went from there. It was, it was, it's, 
a multinational product pro project that's actually still in progress. Um, so he's British. He lives in Italy. Um, I obviously live in, in England. The threads are made in England. It is being shipped to Pakistan for the actual embroidery um, part of it. So I'd done all the design work and the, the sourcing of materials. And then it was going back to Italy for him to put together um, the dressmaking. And then it was going off to France for um, one of the Napoleonic reenactments there at one of the chateaus in Paris. So, so tell the story of that from, from the beginning, though. It's, it's a coat, a replica of a, a coat that Napoleon wore? Not quite. It's, um, it's a, military, a, a, a military dress coat okay. of one of the aide-de-camps of Napoleon I. So basically one of his um, officers, it's it's the coat that, that person would have worn for all the posh occasions um, at court. Mm -hmm. So there's, um, I think, one copy, one um, original coat, I think, in a museum in Italy. And using that and lots of old drawings of designs that the embroiderers used to use at the time that's what helped put it all together but it was it's it's very detailed and very as it's military it's very has to be very exact mm -hmm. so the purpose who who wanted this coat and was it was it for reenactments yes yeah, so my clients um you don't, Does have to, you don't have to name names, but it was somebody who, uh, who wanted it for uh, reenactment things. Yes, absolutely. Just totally for himself. Um, he wanted to outshine the women at court in these reenactments. <laughs> <laughs> because they have lots man, of men. Men, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so he wanted it for these reenactments. He said he'd had some done in the past but they weren't, the quality wasn't as good. So he wanted to really go all out this time. Mm. So it really, it should have been all done for this weekend, actually. There's um, an, a, a reenactment happening at the Chateau Malmaison in Paris this weekend. And he was meant to be wearing it there. But unfortunately, the postal service in Italy <laughs> messed up rather oh. and and it didn't appear when it should have appeared and um so we missed the slot with the studio in pakistan and he didn't then have enough time to make it up so it still needs to be embroidered it still needs to be made up and he still needs to out bling the women oh yeah <laughs> well, and, and i found it fascinating that it you know you had to be so precise on that uniform because it, depending on the ranking, made made a difference in the amount of gold work, correct? Yes, I believe the higher ranking had um, deeper gold work on the the collar. I'm not sure where else. I didn't research the different um, structures of the military for that. But yes, it did have to be very ex exact and it had to have oak leaves. It had to have acorns and acorn cups and it had to have this particular border of two types of gold work all the way around and all measured you know, as i said in that, that clear point on the bbc with millimeters hmm. so as lots of using the ruler <laughs> lots of counting <laughs> and then lots of drawing and tracing and yes but it was really it was really interesting to work on and once they got into the flow of of drawing the oak leaves and and adding the acorns and things, it really came together. It was really nice to see. So, so your role was to draw out and plan out all of the embroidery. Yes. Yeah, so my role was to using all those historical references, design it. Um, I'd been given the paper 
dressmaking patterns. So I had the actual sizing. Oh, okay. So I had that. That was, and I had to have that really so that it was exactly correct. So I put the used tracing paper, traced out the sizes of the, uh, the dressmaking patterns, and then using those, I I um, allocated the areas where the embroidery needed to fit in, and then went from there really. So that's when I started drawing the 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 leaves on and the acorns, and each each because it's a coat, it's got two sides, so each side one was re the reverse of the other. The same with the uh, cuffs, yeah. and and the reverse as well. So there's, there's several pieces that all make it up. And then, but now the the actual coat making the the cloth of the coat that's what happened in Pakistan. The the actual embroidery, the gold work of the coat is what will happen in Pakistan. Okay. Um, it's not there yet. Hopefully, like all the metal threads and the samples that I've I've stitched and all my instructions are hopefully in a car traveling from England to Italy, no France actually, as we speak. I'm, I'm crossing my fingers and hoping that's what... I was going to say, a <laughs> little, little nervous here, yeah. yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then and then it needs to go to Pakistan, and then it'll be stitched, and I'll be working as a consultant on that, checking the quality of their gold work. And, um, and, and, yeah, this may be out of line here, but why didn't you... Why aren't you doing the gold work? Because it's cheaper to have it done in Pakistan. Uh, Plus, but also, but also, they, they, there are more of them. There's just me here, oh. and it would take me a long, long time. And they can do it far more quickly because they have more people. Okay. But primarily, I think it's down to cost. <laughs> time and money, time and money Absolutely. every time. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, but then, as they're doing it, they'll be sending you photos, and so you can check and uh, guide them. Yes, that's the idea. Yeah. Oh. Because the last thing that my client wants to happen is to have all this um, meticulous work done with the designing and sourcing the correct size materials and the samples for them to just go off on their own yeah. whim and ruin it. So yes, we'll be following them avidly. <laughs> <laughs> now materials for something like that, uh, sourcing all those and getting enough uh, challenge these days. I mean, it's so hard for people to get materials these days. Well, the, the gold threads come from a company, they used to be called Benton & Johnson, and right. they're based in, in England. Um, they're now part of another company called Toy Kenning & Spence, based in the Midlands, I think, middle of the country. And they are now the only producer of gold thread in this country. There was another one um, who actually started up from leaving Benson Johnson, he started up on his own, and then he retired after about 15 years. I think the person who's taken it over isn't doing very well in terms of producing the threads. Oh. So so it's just down to them now, and that they are snowed under. <laughs> but, but I think there's only four, maybe four of them, in in that workshop producing the metal threads yeah. and it's quite an involved process there are so many different types yeah. so it, the training element too um but the the quantity of the threads i when i did my sample i had to figure out how much i'd used of each particular thread for a leaf for an acorn for half an acorn for a length of stem for a section of border and then I had to count the number of leaves. I had to measure all the border. And then I had to work out how much thread I needed from that. Oh, Liz. <laughs> oh, man. And, I, just... <laughs> and then I had to add a bit more for mistakes and um, unpickings. Yeah. <laughs> it, wow. it, yeah. It was quite, quite a big order. No kidding. Well, that's that, that's di that's disappointing that we're down to one uh, British company, England British 
making quality gold work threads. Oh boy. I know. I mean, I hope that the other um, person just gets it together and, and manages to you know, make it successful. It was certainly, you know, successful before before then. Yeah. But it is quite, I think, quite a steep learning curve. Maybe they've taken on a bit more than they can currently deal with. I don't know. Don't yeah. really know the story behind that. But yes, yeah, so I just hope that they, you know, Benton Johnson, Toy Kenning and Spence, they carry on because there's certainly demand there. Right. You know, if you put an order in, it's easily about three months before you get it. Mm. So, you know, that was another thing I had to consider with ordering the metal threads for the coat. I um, contacted um, the man in charge there and said, I've got a really urgent order. Can you help me? And they did it in a month, which was amazing. Oh. So they had a, a lovely box of biscuits. I sent them for the thank you. <laughs> hey, whatever works, right? Absolutely. You know? Yes, yes. <laughs> wow, what a project. Holy smokes. I know. You don't yeah. get many like that around. No. Um, no. And, and still ongoing, so you're still on pins and needles a bit about it happening. I know. I just want to hear that it's finally with my client. Yeah. Relax a bit then. Yep. Oh boy. Well, we'll uh, we'll be keeping an eye on on things to see how that comes out. I'm sure you'll be able to post photos at some point. Yeah. Oh yes, I'm looking forward to that. Yep. The other one is lampshades. Yes. Stitching lampshades. Talk to us about that because that does not look easy. <laughs> well, you don't do it in situ. That's good That's to hear. <laughs> I think they just came about because I wanted to do something different that wasn't another picture for the wall. Um, and I just thought, well, if I stitch a lampshade, it'll look really pretty when the light comes through. And at the same time, there was um, a company that had recently put together their own kits for how to make a lampshade. And back then they were, this was maybe eight years ago. They were just the basic drum um, shape stamp shades. And so I started off with those and I just measured out the, the fabric that I needed, the size, and then I just designed it from there. And I, I decided to do it in the colours of the seasons. So I have spring, summer, autumn and winter. And um, <clears throat> and then once I'd stitched it, I, I just made it up into a lampshade. And they've been popular as kits and also for me to stitch for people in different um, shapes actually as well so i've done a few I've done one well, the drum shapes obviously and i've done a few other more unusual shapes but they've all been really fun they're nice nice to do i like adding there's a little snail i add and whenever i stitch my stitch ones for people i always put the snail in a different place so they're all a bit different <laughs> Okay, because because Beth wants to make ten, so <laughs> well, I would allow at least three weeks for each one. Oh yeah, no, no, <laughs> I'm than that I'm slower than that. And, and and what intrigued me about them is that you know you're right. After a while, you get tired of okay, I can frame this, I can make it into a pillow. Now what do I do? And I love to stitch, and it's and when I saw the lampshades, I thought. Well, there's something you, you, you would look at it every day. Um, you would see it. It would get used, and you have your needlework there. It, it's a yeah. great idea. Yeah. Yeah. And I hope that the the making up of the lampshade after you've stitched it isn't too daunting for people. The instructions are quite clear. And I've added a bit to the instructions that come with the lampshade kit rather than the embroidery bit um, just to make it extra clear for everyone. But that, that, I can imagine that would be quite nerve-wracking for, for people. Yeah, see, that's where I, you know, I can see, all right, you, you just have a piece of cloth and you stitch it in the normal way uh, on a frame or whatever you use. But then, yeah, that's where I would run into the freaking out stage is, all right, now I've got to put this on a, on a lampshade frame. So do you provide the, the frame? Yes, it's all provided. So I provide the embroidery side of the kit. So all the instructions, the fabric, the threads, all of that. And then I source the lampshade kit 
from a different company. So that's included in in the kit. Mm-hmm. And so that comes with all the bits that you need to make up a rigid lampshade. There's a key word right there because I could see my lampshade and it wouldn't be particularly rigid. I can see <laughs> wrinkles and twists and all kinds of things. It's a bit... You, the, the, the lining is quite rigid that you you stick the fabric to. Oh, okay. So, so it has like a um, sticky grid paper on it. And so you can line it all up quite easily and just weight it down. That's the, the trick really. Use lots of paper weights so that it doesn't roll up. Your fabric's nice and flat and just do it slowly. There's no rush. And you can, you know, and if, and if you do find that there's a, an air bubble or something, you can just unstick it a bit and then stick it down again. So, what do you use for the um, for the fabric? Is that just normal? It's linen twill. So it's the traditional Jacobean fabric. It has a slight um, diagonal grain on it, and I'm only using that one because it is the, is the traditional fabric. You can use anything really that's quite um, tightly woven. Needs to be a heavyweight fabric though to to support the stitches. So have you thought about doing a white work one? I have actually done a white work one. I've um I've got one that I've made up, not as a kit. It's a pulled thread lampshade. I think it's on my website. I can't remember, but it, it's quite expensive, so no one's bought it. But it's <laughs> it's very pretty. Uh, it's on um it's on like a natural coloured even weave linen with white thread for the stitching and it's it's lots of different ivy leaves with um the the stems and tendrils in a really fine leather cord that's couched down and that looks really effective when the light's on because the light comes through the pulled thread leaves even more than the actual fabric that creates all these little patterns Beth, let's I, go. Let's go, Beth. I, I need another project. Yeah. Yeah, let's go. I think so. Mm-hmm. Yep. But I think white white work, white work on white fabric for a lampshade, I think would just get too dusty. Yes. I, yeah, at my house with the cat, it would. <laughs> yes. Yeah, cats are a bit annoying sometimes. Okay, there you go, Beth. There's your next project right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll watch. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> the other, the other thing in your uh, designs are the uh, the mosaics, the needlepoint mosaics. Uh, the history behind those just fascinates me. Yes, I mean, there are. I think with those mosaics, they were discovered and then they were covered back over, which just sounds bizarre but apparently it was the best way of protecting them. Um, and they were designed by a, a customer of mine who buys my my Appleton's wool. And she wanted to design these, these cushions and she was really interested in the Roman mosaics. And so I think she has four. I, I chose a couple for my, my website. And yeah, they're really effective. Just the repeating pattern. But just the history, I think the history, because they're all mosaics discovered in the UK, I believe. Fishburn and I can't remember what the other ones were. But and yeah, they're lovely. And they're all uh, Roman tile design then? Yes, they are. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that's so neat. Because that, well, there, was, there was something not too long ago where they'd found some in some farmer's field. It looked like it was six feet down that they found... Uh, 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 tile floor that was essentially intact and I that was my first thought was wow get that pattern that get that pattern yeah I, I know I saw something on the news about a farmer was it in Syria I can't remember where discovering one recently yeah yeah they're out there you just don't know where <laughs> <laughs> well the, uh, the the two that you have on your website are I mean, it's really impressive stuff. Glad you glad glad you're offering those because they're um, they're really nice. Yep. So what what is it? Uh, did did you start your business right out of the Royal School, or was there a period of trying things and then you decided to just do it yourself? 
How did, how did you evolve into uh, into your business? I graduated in 98, so a while ago. Um, and I know you mentioned earlier how the, the course at the RSN, either you leave it loving the embroidery or you just can't bear it any longer. <laughs> Actually, it can be a bit of the bit of both. So after graduating, I spent about a year and a half, I think, um, teaching embroidery, working for the RSN, um, doing commissions. And then I just got a bit worn out. It was it was, you know, this was the you know, the days before the internet was, you know, so so widely used. And it was hard to spread the word, it was hard to get commissions, even it was hard to get paid. And oh. it was it was all just hard and I was twenty one and I'd had enough. <laughs> so <laughs> so I actually um became a PA, a personal assistant in an office. Uh-huh. And I did that for ten years. Um and I, I did still did a bit of embroidery at home. But it was actually that break was quite nice. And in the in the end, I found that my fingers are starting to feel itchy in a I must start stitching kind of a way. And that's when I started getting back into it again. Mm-hmm. And that's when um the art of the needle was founded. And that was really to do with teaching and kits and commissions. And then that ran for a few years. And then Lenham Needlecraft came up for sale. And I took that one on as well. I, I had actually been a customer of Lenham's myself. Um, and the lady who ran it was was a lovely old lady. And I always said to her, you know, if you're thinking of selling, do let me know. And she did. And so I took that over about a year or a year and a half before COVID hit. And that's kind of kept me going, really. You know, the, the orders come in all the time. And particularly during lockdowns, it was super busy. Yeah. Everyone was wanting to do something. And the amount of people who said, oh, I've just dug out this this needlework kit from the back of the wardrobe. I think I haven't touched it for about 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> I need some wool. Can you help? So that was really good. Really good. You know, every, lots of people were saying, oh, I've got nothing to do. It's really boring. It's really quiet. I was like, I'm so busy. <laughs> it doesn't stop. But, you know, that was that was really good. It was really good. Um, a bit tiring at times but yeah. it's it's really nice talking to all my customers as well they're all so lovely because they're all like-minded right and it's nice to chat about their projects and they're up to and how long they've been doing it for you know I've got men and women from all walks of life all ages um, across the world actually you all you know use Appleton's wool tapestry or crawl and they have all these wonderful projects on the go. But it's just it's just lovely to, to to chat to them and see what yeah. they're up to. Now, when you bought uh, Lenham, uh, did she have a physical store? No, no, she was um, more of a kind of catalogue. Okay. Type. She she had a website, but it was very clunky. Um, mm. So yeah, I, I took that over and I I completely redid the website made it much more user friendly and moved most of the customers over to online ordering yeah there's still some who who like to have an order form you know to fill in or they call me up and order over the phone and that's all fine but it, it is quicker um doing the orders on the website right. and get more done that way but yeah so I, I took that over, over, I did the website, and then I I merged the art and Lenham into two, well, sorry, into one from being two. So Instagram, Pinterest, Facebook, um, Twitter, and also the website I merged a bit more too. So I started off with two individual websites, both selling products, and that became a bit expensive because you have to pay for the shop aspect right so the needle is more like a 
a marker website, I would say, I would say now. You know, yeah, it has some information about me, but it, the link to the shop takes you to the Lenham. Yeah. So I, I've kind of rejigged it that way. And have you have you enjoyed doing that? I mean, I, interaction with customers has got to be a lot of fun. Um, but especially during the pandemic, getting getting materials and getting them shipped to people is frustrating, I'm sure, at times. Uh, but you've enjoyed the retail end of things? Yes, I have, actually. I have. I mean, just fulfilling an order is, well, very simple. Um, but it's nice to know, particularly during lockdowns, when lots of my clients are older and perhaps live alone, that when they call you, they're calling because they need some wool, but also they could do with a really good chat too. Mm -hmm. And that was nice to be able to provide that as well. And I, you know, I learn stuff at the same time as well. So, you know, it, it benefits both of us. Doing classes these days, you got, uh, what, you're busy on that end, uh, things coming up? It's busier now. Um, we moved during lockdown and I oh, couldn't nice offer. Nice timing there. <laughs> I know, it was very stressful. I don't want to go there. <laughs> um, when we moved, we didn't have internet. So we had to use hotspots on our phone like I think Beth's using right and I, I didn't have the internet capability to host a class online I know I knew how to but I couldn't actually do it and obviously I couldn't do anything in person so only fairly recently we've gone back I've gone back to in-person classes but I also am now able having an internet connection that works to offer online classes so last weekend, I was in Exeter in Devon in the southwest of England, and I was teaching Opus Anglicanum, which is a very ancient English technique right. with silk floss, metal threads. And then beginning of November, I've got an online course of three sections on the Goldwork coat. So it's a bit of a mix, but it's nice to have it like that. You know, you can, I've got someone coming in, um, calling in from America for the the Zoom class, right. which, you know, is is not so easy to do when when you're not in the same country and you want to go to a class and, you know, it's in one country, you're in another. It's just not as practical. So COVID, again, has helped really open up um, online for people. You know, the talks and classes, there's lots to choose from. Yeah, I was curious about your talks, too. Uh, do you offer those on some kind of a schedule? Or are they something no. that if somebody requests? It's more, yeah, as and when they're requested. So I have I have a couple, really, not, not very many, but I have one on myself, <laughs> which, which sounds horribly conceited, but um, that's what people like to hear about. Yeah. And then I have another one coming up, actually on Zoom in America um, on the Goldwork Coat again. So, you know, that's something they particularly requested. Yeah. So I shall deliver. <laughs> when, when is yeah. that? I think that is next year. So I've got a while. <laughs> She's got a while. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There's nothing like a deadline to motivate, I find. Yes. So we'll be able to we'll be able to take that class and and learn all about that coat then. You'll have to join the waiting list, I'm afraid. Oh really? Already? Yeah, it's fully it's fully booked. Wow. The, the November class, anyway. Not I don't know about the lecture. Um, I think that's that's one of the guilds in in America, who who asked me to do that. But yes, the the gold work coat course online is currently fully booked but i have a waiting list and there are names on it already so if i get enough interest i will run it again well good for you <laughs> they spread the word <laughs> that's great yeah, yeah. you uh are you uh tutoring wise do you have a space where you can have people come to you or do you go to them how do you work with that people can come to me i've got space here and good light I, I run a, a regular monthly session, like for two hours, where people come with a range of embroidery techniques and have a chat and a coffee, and they just 
ask me for any help they need or any advice or fabrics or materials and yeah that's just a nice kind of chat along session really and then I sometimes I haven't done it in this house but in my last house I did run some classes from home like whole day classes and I think one was in gold work one was making a brooch so I, I will do that again again it's just getting around to it finding enough time in the day to organize everything yeah right it sleeps sometimes that's the, that's the that's the problem i know and i need sleep <laughs> it does help it does help yeah it, it does i'm quite grumpy otherwise well liz thanks so much this is uh what a fascinating little journey you've had here it's been fun it has been fun hard yeah. work but fun and enjoyable yep well thanks yeah. for doing this and thanks for every to everyone for listening mm -hmm.